And then we're going to start doing this regularly so that we have the ammunition we need when we go out to the public and when we engage with our clients, when they ask us questions about the market, we can speak intelligently and hopefully convert them into long-standing clients and referral partners. So my name is Mark Burstein. I'll be uh, moderating and going over uh, most of the, some of the stats. Uh, today we have Alan Wang with us, Yvette Peterson, and Timothy Chow. And everyone will give their perspectives on what they see in the market. And we'll go over some of their personal experiences with their listings and buyers that uh, in the last couple of weeks that they were able to uh, successfully navigate. And uh, we'll talk about their successes with those and how they're able to uh, gauge the market in uh, today's, today's economy. So we're going to go over some market data for uh, the general county of Santa Clara, as well as kind of the local cities that we represent. And guys, if there's other areas or cities that you'd like for me to target in the future, please text or uh, put it in the chat and let me know. Uh, for now, we're going to be, or for today's discussion, uh, what I've prepared today is uh, stats for the uh, county of Santa Clara, uh, the city of Santa Clara, where our office is. We'll talk about the city of San Jose, Sunnyvale, Cupertino, uh, Saratoga, and Los Gatos. And these guys will kind of give you an overview too. I know there's a bunch of other infill cities like Campbell and so forth and so on. Uh, but this will at least give you guys a good overview. And then, uh, like I said, if there's any other specific areas you'd like me to cover in the future, please uh, just hit that in the chat or, or uh, let me know. And uh, we'll include those in future runnings of the market statistics. So uh, to get into it here, uh, overall in the county of Santa Clara, we have a, our median sales price for the month of May is 1.3 million. How lucky are we, huh, as real estate agents, where our median price is, is at 1.3 million? And how lucky are we that our average days on the market is only nine days, and we're getting an average of 103% of list price, meaning that people are overbidding for most of the listings that are coming on the market by an average of at least 3%. You know, some people are still getting deals. I'm hearing about people getting under list price, which means that someone's paying more than 3% over list price to balance things out, right? So 103% is where we're at. Uh, 31 closed sales in the county this month, 51 last month, and a year ago we were at 79. So it's a little challenging right now, in my opinion, to really reflect statistics year over year because we have this thing called COVID-19 this year. And unfortunately, that's kind of handcuffed us over the past few months. Now what is happening over the past few months is it's been a challenge to get properties viewed during the shelter-in-place lockdown. Simple as that. I know that many agents have been holding listings back that are owner-occupied. Um, I know I have a couple, and they'll be coming on in the next few months, um, and it's just a, an, an interesting conversation that we have with our clients a few months ago, and now that we're coming out of that, uh, we'll hopefully start to see things normalize uh, over the next three or four months, right? Median sales price this month versus last month has come down a little bit in Santa Clara County. Uh, the days on the market has gone up just ever so slightly. And the number of new listings coming on uh, month over month has been about the same. Uh, average list price, uh, 106 to 103%. So it's come down a little bit. And uh, average cost per square foot, that's a little misleading sometimes because lot sizes vary and so forth and so on. Uh, that's gone up. And then uh, relative to a year ago today, our number of sales is obviously much lower, right? 31 this month, a year ago in May, we had almost 80. Now what's May typically? Typically May is kind of the end of the spring buying season. It's a very heavily transacted month in general. Unfortunately, obviously with the COVID, uh, things have scaled down, but what hasn't scaled down so much is the prices, right? We're only seeing uh, 100,000 average price drop, which is less than 10%. Much, much less than 10%. Um, and the median days on the market's actually a little lower. So our market, I think, is still healthy um, when it comes to Santa Clara County. Uh, Santa Clara County, uh, average days on market uh, versus list price. <clears throat> you can see it by the chart. Over time, uh, over the last two years, the uh, percentage of list price in June, July of uh, 2018, May, June, July of 2018 was the peak as it came down through 18, end of 18 
beginning of 19, we kind of saw a valley. And then we kind of, uh, throughout 19, we were uh, steady around 102 to 104% of list price. And then the end of the year, things started to dip in the city uh, as far as uh, people making bids. And inventory also started to drop. And then the beginning of the year, we kind of hit the ground with uh, very low inventory. The medium days on the market dropped considerably. Our overall activity dropped considerably due to COVID. But the percentage of list price versus sale price was still pretty high uh, coming out of March. And now, as we see, it's starting to come down a little bit through April and May. <clears throat> and that's uh, the Santa Clara County. Does anyone, does, Alan, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, the county and where you see things kind of going in a general area for the? Uh, just general kind of where pricing is going overall? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's hard. Obviously, there's so many different types of products out there. But I would say from what I'm seeing, condos are struggling a bit, which you have that slide up right now where you, I'll let you talk to that. But I do feel that condominiums and townhomes are, are there are deals to be had here. I think we're writing two offers today that are obscene, honestly, from a, a, a bargain for a buyer. Uh, but it's good for the buyer, right? There's, there's opportunities are sitting around there. Uh, if you're talking single family home under this median price, they're moving. They're moving very well, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But if we're talking over median, especially in the upper range, I'm talking two, five plus, you know, those are, are struggling in my opinion. This depends on what kind of product we're talking about. Certain products are moving, certain are not. Uh, overall, I wouldn't be surprised if, as you mentioned, right, the, the overall median price should be leveling or, you know, even tempering down a little bit, uh, given everything going on. But uh, with the low inventory, that's where things are, 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 are unclear at the moment. And if you're working with buyers now, what types of uh, conversations are we having? As far as you said, you mentioned you wrote two offers. I mean, are, are you guys uh, going through the multiple offer scenarios with your clients or what's the scenarios what kind of conversations yeah the two today are townhomes have been on the market for a while i'm talking over 50 days and so they're we're we're, we're definitely going under and it, it's an offer i wouldn't have written you know two weeks on the market right but at 50 some odd days uh it, anything goes right so we're we're definitely trying to get a deal uh, and seeing how how desperate is the seller right how motivated are they and that's what we're doing there uh, but as far as buyers are concerned, I mean, I've been having, we really have to play the field, right? There's certain homes that are still moving. Uh, again, if they're moving ready, they will fly. And so if you're getting multiple competitors, uh, then you have to decide, you know, do the overbidding strategy. But if it's sitting around for a while, then yes, of course, you can go in there, go deep and see what happens. So yeah, my advice to, to everyone as you're talking to your buyers is read the field. I mean, uh, we had a client that wanted to offer 700,000 under list on day one on the market. I mean, that's not going to work. Right, the house ended up selling at list price, around list price, uh, and it had two or three offers. So you can't, everyone thinks they're getting a deal because it's COVID, but if there's, it's a nice house, it's beautiful, and it's the only one on the market of its kind, and you have multiple offers, you can't do that. You have to uh, read the field properly and deploy the right strategy. And they are getting those offers, yeah? People are coming in Yes. with the, with the new uh, aggressively priced homes. Yvette, you mentioned you had a couple of your, your teammates were having some success with, successes with buyers. How is their scenarios playing out? Are they having to beat a lot of people up to get in or are they able to negotiate? We're still seeing multiple offers. I think that the, both of the offers that Brian uh, got in contract um, had multiple offers. Penny has one that just got in contract, but that is a, um, a new home construction. So there are great opportunities with new home constructions right now. Uh, so I would definitely steer your buyers in that direction. But the buyers that are saying, wait and see, we have one strategy, and that is we will not try to convince them. We're just going to support what we're telling them with data. So I think if you come at it where you just bring data to the table, that's what they're interested in. They're not interested in what you think and what you feel. And if you stay in that, in that lane, they'll stay in that lane. So I think you have to move them out of that lane by bringing data. I know, I know that's something that Alan Wang has taught me well. I mean, data is king. So um, something we talk about in our team meetings regularly is do not convince anybody, bring data, become masters at the right question and also the data. Awesome, thank you, Yvette. Timothy, you want to unmute yourself? There you go. 
Timothy, how has your experience been with buyers in the past couple of months? Um, for the past two months, I have shown quite a good, a good amount of home to, from toward the peninsula down to South San Jose. And I do see that when you go up north, the percentile that people pay more. Well, earlier, you did mention that the, the people pay about 103% over asking price. But when you go toward that direction, I see it go up between 119 to some up to 140%. When you are from San Jose, go to Uroy, Morgan Hill, that's where people actually pay less than, uh, still over asking, but it's much less than what the, on, the, on the percentage. Uh, yet I have seen home listed within seven days and the listing agent already complained that it's already too long. I need those offer to be in it already. <laughs> so yes, uh, seller and the listing agent a perspective of the market is still very strong and the buy if you want to get in you got to submit an offer and people are not waiting um i got into a few transactions where within that five to seven days and there are multiple offer we're not talking about 20 30 offer but between five to eight is the norm yeah, and then i also good. agree with uh, uh yvette that you got to support the client with the data because with all the uncertainty out there with the COVID, with all the process people anticipate that the market is going down right mm -hmm. realistically if if we don't see the, the start the data you or myself would think the same that the market will be changing but when you look at the activity look at the buyer out there then we truly believe that the market here in the bay area is phenomenal uh, and we're not speaking for the for the california or for the country but we talk about the local we are doing extremely well here and the market is very stable awesome and I think to the, the data portion of it um i think the real turning point for the, the buyers i was working with was when we finally had enough data to support the activity that was happening throughout covid properties that went on the market uh, at the beginning of sip and then sold during that time. And when we finally got all that data, um, that was, I think, what helped convince those uh, buyers to move forward. Very, all right, very good. Very good. Well, let's look at a little, let's look at a little bit more data as we progress through the cities. What well, we did the Santa Clara County, this is for the actual city of Santa Clara where our office resides. And the city sales, median sales price is still pretty good, million thirty-five. They had 27 closed sales last month. 10 days is the average days on the market with 103% of list price. Again, single family homes, 27 closed this month. Last month was 46. So we're seeing things slow down in the town a little bit. Um, a year ago, obviously they had a lot more activity because they weren't sheltered in place. Uh, the median sales price has dipped a little bit uh, month over month. Uh, days on market's gone up a little bit. Um, the number of new listings has come down and the percentage over list price has come down a little bit in the town. Um, it looks like in Santa Clara, things might be slowing down a little bit, but still we have, as far as active to pending ratios go, a uh, very strong, almost one to one. So 25% uh, off <clears throat> pendings to sold, which is still ridiculously strong. Uh, average days on market sitting uh, pretty low. Uh, right now, uh, but it has jumped in the last month in the town. And then again, the median prices in the town, um, kind of reflective of all that data as well. It, it was ramping up through February, March, and April, and now things are kind of cooling down. Now, personally, I think in general, we're going to see that trend. I think that uh, after three months of sheltering in place, we're kind of seeing a little bit of fallout from that lack of activity on those averages. So as we come out of the shelter in place, it'll be really interesting to track to see how these numbers progress over the next 30 to 60 days, if that downward trend continues, or if we start to flatten out and come back up. Because the active depending ratios say our market's very strong seller's market. So it's it, those indicates that that's gonna turn around uh, most likely as we come back to, to full view. Sunnyvale median sales price is a little bit higher than Santa Clara, it's up at a one nine. They had a lot more activity with 42 close sales, average eight days on the market. Uh, percentage of list price is about the same. 
Uh, 102% kind of tells me that there's a few offers in every house, not a heck of a lot of offers, but a few. So there's always competition bringing things up a little bit up over the list price. Uh, the rolling 24 months in Sunnyvale is very similar to what we've seen in Santa Clara. Uh, it was really hot in May of 18. It started to cool off throughout 18. Uh, and then in 19 was fairly stable, cooled off. And then at the end of the year, all our inventory in Sunnyvale also dropped off. So when we started the next year, <clears throat> low inventory is going to keep the low numbers, but it'll keep that percentages of miss, uh, list price to sales price uh, very high. <clears throat> Condos and cone home separation in Sunnyvale uh, over time. Uh, and this one here, it looks like the townhouses and condos, the prices are starting to jump up a little bit um, at the end. We get the Cupertino, Cupertino, the median's leaving a little higher, a little over 2 million. Uh, only 12 closed sales though, the inventory there is suffering. I'm interested to see how Cupertino is going to react with the uh, new rules regarding off-market listings. Are there a lot of off-market listings in Cupertino, especially in that Monta Vista High area that's always extra desirable, uh, especially if you're under $2 million, good luck. So <clears throat> here we are in Cupertino this month. Uh, the number of sales, obviously a lot lower than um, Sunnyvale. I think just their inventory in general is a lot lower. Meeting days in the market with 30 new listings coming on the market this month, it looks like things are gonna start to pick up in Cupertino as we come out of the tip. As we look at the uh, rolling 24 averages, and it's very similar to what we've seen in other areas, hot in 18, flat in 19, looking like it was gonna cool off, and then because of a lack of inventory, we're starting to see, our, starting to see the prices in uh, Cupertino rise at the beginning of this year, and again, taper off as we're uh, rolling into the third, third and a half month of the SIP. Uh, price trends in Cupertino over the past two years have remained fairly flat though. Saratoga is at 2.6 uh, medium price. Also lower number of closed sales. Days on the market start to go a little higher in 101% of list price. And Emily, you touched on this. The luxury market is not going crazy. <clears throat> so a lot of this 101% in Saratoga are the homes that are at the lower end of their price spectrum. The homes that are up over three, three and a half million are uh, tending to sit a little bit. And I think for the next part of our segment, I might break out uh, the luxury section of, of uh, the markets to see if they can take 10% off the top. That could maybe adjust these numbers uh, to be a little more, just a little more accurate maybe uh, when we admit that the, the upper 10%, those luxury homes, because uh, even that, you know, even in the luxury areas, there's still a good handful of homes priced between 10 and $20 million. And those just don't move every day. They may not move every month. So we're looking at uh, transactions in those areas under $3 million are much more prevalent. Again, the graphs are re pretty reflective uh, of the general area uh, over the last two months with regards to uh, the rolling prices and the percentages over list price um, the days on market again has started to, to grow from March, April, and May. And again, I think a lot of that is luxury. Uh, on those the townhomes in Saratoga, uh, pricing is relatively flat over the last two years, uh, but we're looking at a, looks like a little drop here uh, with regards to the condos and townhomes. You know, again, in Saratoga and Los Gatos too, we're gonna see there's a couple of townhomes that are gonna be priced kind of over one five and they'll go but most of them are going to be priced below or really close to a million. So if one of those big boys hit, it's going to skew the numbers up a little bit, or if they don't hit, it may skew those numbers down at the end, um, which is what we could see there at that, that dip. Uh, Los Gatos averages are a bit lower than Cupertino and uh, Saratoga. So Los Gatos is maybe a little bit more affordable. Uh, 1.96 is the median price, 24 close sales, a little lower price, a lot more sales. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, 12 days on the market. What does surprise me a little bit is their percentage of list price over uh, sold price. But again, even with these low numbers, and uh, Los Gatos is another one of those towns where if they have a sale that's up over 10 million, it'll skew things <clears throat> a little artificially. And again, those homes that are listed in the upper echelon, let's say up over 5 million, the chances of them getting list price is slim. Most of those are going to be negotiating down. So they'll hit that 
average, they may artificially drop that. Uh, if you're looking at the price segments at the lower end, under the median price in Los Gatos, I bet that percent over list price is going to climb uh, up over 100%. Rolling averages over 24 months, uh, a little flatter than some of the areas that we've seen or that have seen more fluctuations like Santa Clara and Cupertino. Um, Los Gatos has been a little flatter uh, over uh, the last two years. And uh, pricing, you can see the wave is, is a little bigger with regards to single family homes. And again, the luxury market, uh, maybe in October of 2010, they may have sold you know, a nice $30 million or $20 million house, and that'll skew those numbers. Uh, up a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the experiences we've been having uh, with our listing. Uh, I know, Alan, this is one of your pendings uh, that you've had on. It looks like uh, only six days on the market here. Can you tell us a little bit about how that went and how much activity you guys had so uh, we can uh, know what to expect? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those products that that were just moving ready given the property was was only uh six years new uh, built brand pretty much all, brand new very close to brand new construction ropes and home uh what's fascinating is that the property on both sides have sold this year as well literally left and right side of this house uh one unit sold exactly the same uh, very similar score footage sold for uh 2.118 uh back in january and if you, if you guys remember, the year started off very strong for sellers. Prices were, uh, homes were slim, uh, not much inventory, uh, home prices were going up. Uh, so in January, the neighbor sold for 2.118. Uh, then the other neighbor on the other side in March, right before COVID, they closed right before COVID, uh, basically a February contract date and a March, uh, early March close, uh, sold for 2.15. Uh, so those were, I mean, if you're talking about comps, those are as best as you can get. Uh, we... What the, the buyer didn't know, and hopefully the buyer agent is not on this call, but it's okay, we're closing tomorrow, is that our, our buyer actually put in a contingent sale on their house for a property in Los Altos, which as mentioned, over three mil was struggling, right? So we, they accepted a contingent sale. So we only had 21 days to sell this house to get into contract. And then Wilson, you and I need to talk about that. Um, so what we did was we said, all right, give us 30 days. They said, no, we'll give you 21 days to get in contract. And I asked for a 60 day close and we negotiated to a 55 day close. Uh, but luckily we picked up a all cash buyer and we pushed them. They came at two, one very strong offer, non-contingent seven day close. Uh, we pushed them up a little bit to two mil, uh, 2.115. Uh, now we didn't catch the 215 or the 2118, but despite with everything going on and what we needed, we in, you know, we did get some showings, but I mean, this offer was very strong. So we decided to, uh, that to take it. And of course the sellers were hanging on to that peak pricing in March. And I told them that's just not reasonable right now. Uh, the reason is this property doesn't have a school district and it's in the up, that upper 2 million range. Uh, and you know, those, a lot of people will take this and maybe buy something in Sunnyvale or, or Mountain View or uh, somewhere else with a better school district. And so that's why I said, this is pretty darn good. Let's take it. So that that's, so it's 2.115 all cash. Uh, did you have multiple offers or was that the only one? Uh, we, we, we had another one coming in, but this one was so strong. I told them uh, they, they were going to write one at two. And I told them, uh, I'm not sure you want to do that because we were pretty much about to ink this. So I would have had a couple of offers actually, uh, but this one was so strong. We just, we went with it. Did you guys have a date set or were you taking them as they come? Uh, we took them as they come. And the reason for that is because of the situation we had on the buy side. I see. It's very good. How about uh, cold water? You guys got that cold one water. for four days. Was that kind of a similar situation or did you guys, that's a little oh, lower price point. This is, was a madhouse. This was something I, I did not e expect. Uh, we, uh, we've basically been holding this property just to see the activity in the neighborhood. And as we started seeing more activity, we decided to put it on the market. I, I remember I mentioned to you homes that are under that median price are still doing pretty well. Uh, this one was one of those. I think we were initially around COVID, we were estimating this property to be about 825 uh, and maybe 850 at best. Uh, and, and then as things started opening up again, things started changing. We, we put it on right at 850 and we noticed that at 850, you would buy a three bedroom in this area. So we, we felt that there was value to that fourth bedroom. Uh, long story short, I mean, we, were, we got an offer on day two and then 
uh, we had two offers and before you knew it, we had five offers and we were countering. It was, it was just, it was crazy. And we thought about setting a date. Uh, we didn't settle. There were a few offers. There were three offers on the table. We didn't settle uh, for those. So then we waited and there were two more that came after that came really strong. Uh, so we're impending for 885K on this one, non-contingent. Uh, a lot of them had terms, which, which we didn't feel that at day two or four or three, we had to settle for a, a, a contingent offer. So we were just basically waiting and, and seeing if someone else came. So yeah, we got 885 on this uh, in four days. Yeah, the big question, this is the hard part right now, right? If you set a date and nobody mm-hmm. comes, then you look foolish, right? And then if you have you know too many people, uh, we basically ended up rounding five people up, which is pretty darn good. And we pitted them against each other and we pushed them as far as we can go. Uh, looking back, I mean, uh, it was hard to tell uh, what was going on. So, uh, you know, you kind of roll with it as you, as you can. Uh, but if, if they had come at least maybe five or six days in, then I might have just set a date. But they came so early and then we just kind of had to uh, – they were decent offers too. So we worked with what we had in our hands. And if none of these five offers worked out, we would have set a date for the following week. So that's that was our our uh, our backup plan going in. Awesome, Helen. We had a question from Maddie um, on the previous listing. You noticed that you put three and a half percent out to the buyer side. <clears throat> you want to touch a little bit about that? Was uh, that effective? We'll, we'll take that one offline. Actually, Maddie, uh, there was actually an error made on my side on that one. That was meant for a different listing, but we'll take that one offline. Lesson learned: double check if you have a lot of listings. Make sure you're updating the right one. Uh-huh. All right. And then uh, as far as sold goes, looks like you sold, you closed the orange tree lane, got a oh, good 10% almost over list price. Yeah, you know, this That's one Cupertino. was, yeah, this was Cupertino. This was, if you look at the date, literally I had set a date the week before on this one uh, for, for uh, the 16th uh, for review, offer review. If you guys remember that was shelter in place, right? Uh, yeah. I had a tough decision to make. Do, do I move it or, I mean, but we had so much momentum already that we just went with it. We ended up getting seven offers anyways. And the, uh, we were expecting over two, two, uh, and, and a possibility of touching two, two, five or two, three. Yeah. We had so much traffic and inquiries, but shelter in place made folks very nervous. And so at that very moment in time, people were not, uh, really had the appetite. Uh, our sellers were okay with it. I mean, it's a trustee sale. And you know, there's so much uncertainty, they decided to just take it and go. I think after that, maybe a, a few weeks after or a month after, I think uh, we might have been able to squeak out more money on that one. But uh, it's just poor timing. All right. But we did well. I mean, they still did well. It's still. Yeah, multiple uh, offers in seven days, list under 1.9 in Cupertino. That's a good move. So it's good to see that the activity is there and it's tough to underlist in Cupertino. Yvette, you want to talk about Mira Vista Court? Looks like you got that one done pretty quickly. Yeah, actually it was done in five days. This was the reason why it says zero is because shelter yeah, in place, they weren't counting, right? Mm-hmm. But um, it was done on a Friday and we took offers on a Wednesday. So my strategy when it comes to, um, you know, setting an offer date is I wait till the end of the first weekend that it's on. And I see how many people actually um, have viewed the property and have requested disclosures. And then based on that is, is, you know, if I've got five, if I've got five disclosures down and three people who want to write an offer, I set a date. Um, So that's what I usually do because then it gives the opportunity for a bidding war, which happened actually on this one. We did not take the highest price. The highest price was over 1.3. And my clients did to take 1.285 because the, if there was only one contingency alone and they were nervous about the whole COVID-19 and, um, you know, the other, the highest offer price had a, um, had a 21 day loan contingency and had a 21 day um, pro, uh, property contingency and a 14-day appraisal contingency, which was kind of ridiculous because it was all clean. So obviously we went with um, this offer. This is it. So vacant homes, remodeled homes, repairs made, which is what we did. The roof needed repairs. They did that. The, um, 
the, the termite inspection called out problems and we took care of all of that. So this, you know, is the type of property that ends up with a bid and more because everything's done, it's moving ready. Again, three bedroom, um, two baths, large lot, good schools, eights, nines, tens in this area. So uh, this part of the area. Good job, a good job not, not taking that, that one three. Sometimes, you know, <clears throat> when you see offers that don't make sense, it's sometimes yeah. good just to keep walking. And, you know, yeah. even though it's a high number, you know, 21 days for contingencies, to me, does this agent know where he's working? That yeah. doesn't really fly here. So what that tells yeah. me, things that are out of the norm, is that these guys are probably doing, they got something up their sleeve. And it's probably a good thing because uh, they may have come back and said, oh, we're scared from COVID, drop us to 1-1. One, one. But instead, you took the, the offer with the fewer hurdles, and it's probably ended up working out well for you at the end because it closed. <clears throat> Yeah. there's no guarantee and, that and the highest price guys is always going to close so it's important to really evaluate those offers and also understand that when you're making offers uh for, for your clients i know we try to squeeze out that highest price but if they're not comfortable going to that highest price well get them as high as you can and then let's make everything else awesome what else can we do to make this offer the most attractive we can i know it's not there on price but maybe on contingencies maybe we can do something there to show the seller we're ultra motivated, we really want this house. Well, this 1.285 actually started at 1.225. So you can you see they came up $60 to get the house. And my mm -hmm. client said after the first night that she felt like she slept well. And so I just advised her of the things that could go wrong and the things that could go right, and she made the right decision. Huh? Oh, Manet. Manet, what about Manet? How'd that go? Similar situation again, Monet vacant, remodeled. I always advise my clients to make all repairs. I explain to them why. I say then that, you know, it's so amazing to me that they could see $8,000, a buyer can see $8,000 worth of repairs on termites, and they somehow equate that to $50,000 less on their offer price, right? Come on, we all know that one. So that's why, I explain, that's how I explain to my sellers that it's important to just clean up the property. Uh, these, you know, they even put in the canister lights to brighten it up. They just did everything that they could. They had re really great, um, you know, pride of home ownership. So again, this one, I had <laughs> the open house the weekend before we had shelter in place on that Monday. And everybody was showing up at the open house with masks and gloves. They were scared at that point. But we had over 100 groups come through that weekend. And then on the Monday, shelter in place. And on Wednesday, we received 11 offers. And we received, um, yeah, 11, 11 offers on this one. And the one that we took, this went, you can see the difference, right? It went $158,000 over asking. It broke a record in that complex right there. So um, here in Sunnyvale, good things going to get, again, why did it go this high or why did this happen? Really simple, it's in a good school district. It's Cupertino Middle, Cupertino Elementary, and Fremont High School in Sunnyvale. And the Fremont High School is about a two minute walk from their front door. Convenient. So again, they had all wonderful things, good schools, walking distance, um, good location. All right, awesome. Tim, have you, have, have you been working uh, the buyers over the last uh, few months with uh, the COVID fears, uh, whatnot? How, how has your experience been? Have you been competing with offers and whatnot? You're muted, bud. I can't hear you hit, you want to hit the mute? Please, Tim. I just unmuted him. I think he unmutes himself and then you mute him or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy, can you unmute? Okay, I just unmuted you again, Timothy. Okay. Don't push anything. We can't hear you. Okay, it works now. Can you guys hear me? Sorry about that. Excellent. So in the past uh, two months, I have shown houses. The month of March, 
mid of April, some of my clients been very skeptical. They didn't want to get out. But in late April, May, uh, um, we went out with gloves, uh, masks, and I think it's, it's went, okay, it went well. Um, the buyers at the same time, I mean, I think it's take a lot of education and, and, and guidance from you being an agent to let the buyer know what's going on. Uh, without that, of course, people anticipate differently. The majority of people, by when I first met or when I first meet them, they always expect that what is the market, how much how, how much the market is going down now, should I wait and, and until you show them the statistics, that these are the number, then they, I, I mean, it's a wake up call for many buyers and I mean, you can totally relate it back in the month of March when the market was at the peak. So really, this is a good time for those buyers to get in if they if, if they have lost or if they competed in the month of January, February, and March, and they lost, right? So, so when I took the buy out, I mean, some, some we still lost in many cases, such so that the buy become more uh, related to the current market than what they hear on the news. Because some, t some time ago, some of the article on the news even said that the market will have a correction up to 30% now. Uh, I'm sure some of us might have seen those articles, right? And it never yeah. happened here, so. Yeah, um, so it sounds like things are moving, are still moving along according to our Silicon Valley pace. Well, this Looks morning, like, uh, buyers are buyers are out and they're making offers. They're not scared of multiple offers, and they're not scared of the news, right? We do have a lot of doom and gloom news, but buyers are still coming out. They're paying good money for property, and our market's still moving pretty strong. Guys, once those active to pending ratios start hitting like uh, oh one pending for every five active, then we'll start to see the prices really start to change. Uh, but for now. You know, I've been surprised. I do it like every Monday. I look up in the Santa Clara County. I just do a general search on the MLS for active homes. And then I unclick the active and I hit the contingent and pending and just look at the number. And this, you know, this week we're sitting around 1,600 active and around 1,200 pending, which is very strong, very strong indicators of a seller's market. And what I've been expecting is for that number to, to, to divert to divest right i was expecting over the last two months the number of active listings to start going up and those number of pendings to start dropping off but they really haven't they really haven't so we'll see what happens as we come out of the shelter in place i know i'm telling my buyers that hey you know uh, <clears throat> the bottom is bottomed out i think uh, maybe two or three weeks ago i think that's when there may have been the most fear in the market and i think as we're coming out now People will see the statistics and the fear will start to shrink and people will come out with more. And I'm just an internal optimist maybe, who knows? But that's what my crystal ball says. Now, any questions from the audience? You guys uh, have any concerns specifically you'd like any of us to address with regards to what we talked about today? Any buyer challenges if you guys wanna? If everyone, everyone's probably muted, but if you want to throw something up in the chat, we can address it. Go. Yeah. Alan, I know, I'm sorry, uh, Mark, yeah. there, I know that I, that I get constantly, and I just was, maybe you could just round robin around. Alan, the listings that he, that we had up there, um, where did you get them? Where'd they come from? Yes, uh, one one was referred by an agent in our office uh, from the commercial group, which is really nice. So we're I'm doing the residential part, and then he's doing the 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 uh, 1031 exchange uh, into a commercial property. So this is one nice thing about us being in the same office, right? We can work together. That's one. Uh, the rest of the listings that that I've had are all my personal sphere of influence. So that uh, property at Savannah Mountain View. I'll tell you guys a funny story. Uh, clients bought that during the boom when the builders were not paying any commission at all. Uh, you can imagine how excited I was about that. Uh, but as a good friend, 
I still represented them and I did it and I did it for free. And, and, uh, and the point of that is what good, good things come back to you later. Uh, so I'm helping them buy this next house and we sold that one. So that, that's something to keep in mind, right? If you uh, be a giving person, it eventually comes back to you. Uh, coal, yeah, and then cold water was the 1031 exchange. Yeah, but all the rest of them have been, I uh, had an interesting listing today where uh, a sign two days ago where a gentleman came to one of my seminars and I couldn't remember which one it was and I haven't really had that many. And it turned out that one of our, our mutual friends had brought him to the seminar and I, I remembered him after uh, he mentioned that. Uh, so, I mean, it just, and it was, this was years ago, right? Three years ago or something to that effect. So, uh, but yeah, mostly sphere. How about you, Yvette? How'd you get your listings? Um, again, same thing, mostly actually a lot of mine coming from, um, the, my SOI, I would say that probably 95% of my business is SOI or referrals from my SOI. So I had a buyer, um, about one and a half weeks into COVID night or shelter in place. I had a buyer, uh, that was a referral from a friend and, uh, that was also a challenge. So we're having some lender challenges in the middle of the, all of this. I have um, a listing that's on the market right now, Cupertino, and that is a two bedroom, two bath townhouse. Bring me a buyer folks. <laughs> and then we have a single family home in Sunnyvale that also, this, this is all coming out of the COVID-19. While we were in shelter in place, we just called people and cared for them. Um, I have two things I want to do. I just want to connect and and um, care for people. And out of that came a situation where one of the people I called called me back a couple weeks later and said, "My husband, my ex husband, and I own a house, and we got to get out from underneath this because he's sinking me." And I just um, help her with that situation, and that's currently being rehabbed. Um, you know, they, they want 1.8 and the house needs a lot of repairs. So we're working on that one. But all of these are SOIs. There's one that currently up in Newcastle, a million seventy five, and that's the one mark that we talked about that I had to do three extensions of a den for the addendum on the loan. And on Friday night, after being in contract for about 17 days we found out that the loan was not going to get approved and we had to switch lenders on Friday night and we got conditionally approved with a fantastic lender uh, this morning or sorry, yesterday. And we will definitely be lifting the loan contingency tomorrow. So that was a hustle to, but you know, again, we got to be careful because that was a situation where the buyer had taken out a, um, you know, forbearance, and they just thought that, you know, there'd be no hits coming back on them. So that's what caused it to fall out of contract with, with the lender. So anyways. That's very timely, actually. Yeah, forbearance has been a, an issue for, uh, for folks. So be careful, guys, when you're out there looking or uh, working with your buyers or taking your listings. Um, depending on what their situation was with the borrowers, some people are having to go through a forbearance. Some people are getting deferments. So make sure that your clients, just because they're making their payments to B of A or Wells, doesn't mean that B of A or, L or Wells owns that loan. If the big bank owns the loan, the chances of them tacking it onto the end and postponing are high, and the chances of having any negative consequences are low. If it's forbearance, if the loan is owned by an individual investor or a hedge fund or whoever they sell it to, it could be a myriad of people, they may not be so forgiving. They may not get the same benefits from the government. So they're going to put you the, the, the borrow in forbearance because they want their money. They really don't want to be delayed. And that, and in those cases, those borrowers are having negative consequences with regards to their credit and their loans. So just make sure that when you're counseling your clients, they call and find out who actually owns that loan before they make any real decisions as to whether they're going to try to skip a payment or not, and obviously, if they're in a situation where they can't make a payment, then it's then it's a different case. Um, so, as far as you know, Tam asked the question as far as challenges with jumbo loans and higher rates, is it harder to get approval? I think the banks are looking harder and longer because they see the risk level 
going through the roof, especially with jumbos that aren't going to be picked up by the government agencies. So there, yeah, that's called, that is a problem. I think it's been part. a problem. I, I've had a couple of high-end buyers, the Netflix kind of guys, uh, they lost their pre-approvals because uh, the lenders that they were pre-approved with are no longer offering those programs. So uh, my brokers are, are able to get them new different programs, but just keep that in mind, especially people that you may have been that may have been pre-approved 30 or plus days ago, make sure that pre-approval gets updated because the lending climate has changed, especially jumbos. So thank you for that question. Uh, Tam. Uh, Mark, uh, Timothy, for, Timothy wanted to say something. I wanted yeah. to comment on this one. Please. Yeah, I, I do think the reason why all the local lenders around here, Wells Fargo, B of A, they also been making it very difficult to get the loans uh, because um, early 2020, Wells Fargo announced that County of Santa Clara or the Bay are uh, in the high risk area. And since then, they actually make it more difficult to, uh, to get the mortgage. And I think other lenders try to follow that same path. Uh, that's number one thing. Uh, secondly, um, when it, any loan that higher than seven hundred sixty-five thousand dollar loan is no longer, it is not guaranteed by the government of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which is they, the lender had to put on fund or investor funding for the cap loan. Uh, on March the night, when the market dropped, uh, a lot of those lender. Um, had a margin call on the fund so that they kind of short on cash in order to close the loan. That's why majority, bigger lender, they slow down on the jumbo loan. Smaller lender, they cut down a lot of different program. Uh, therefore, right now, it's a little bit challenging to go out there and get jumbo loan, uh, especially um, local lender the same way. Uh, but if you are looking for high balance loans, which is 765000 or less, then there are a lot of lenders that out there can offer those program, and you don't have to really uh, stay with Wells Fargo B of A because of those guidance that they changed since earlier this year. Alan, did you have something to say? Uh, to yeah, that? just re really quick. I mean, uh, obviously, the banks such as uh, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, these are a paper type of loans, right? So if you have a a client that's very well qualified, works in tech, ample down payment, uh, you know, those are definitely good banks. I I heard, and I still need to confirm that. I mean, Wells Fargo has been holding pretty steady with with that same kind of what Timothy's saying that that high, you know, that a paper type of deal. I heard that B of A's pulled back a lot of their programs, so they're requiring more down payment. Uh, and, and, and the debt to income ratio is dropping. That's what I've heard on that one. Uh, but I'm definitely confirmed with your your uh, representative there. Awesome, very good. Looks like US Bank is a good source, Wilson. Thank you very much. Yeah, US Bank seems to have closed some jumbos. Uh, they're usually a pretty progressive lender. From Vidya, has anyone have any, uh, or do you guys have any specific marketing that you did, especially during the shelter in place that helped bring the buyers to your listings? Anything special, Alan or Yvette, Tim, if you have listings? You I, know, personally, I, I go ahead, Yvette. Go, go. I've added Matterport, which I didn't do before. Um, obviously, because people don't have that same accessibility to an open house. If we don't have an open house, you can't walk in without an, an agent, obviously. So um, just recently we tried something this weekend where we put out open house signs and we put the Zoom link on that. That is, um, that garnered a couple people swinging by and uh, doing still doing a virtual Zoom uh, to tour the house. Uh, you know, I, d I don't know what to say, you can't really, I found out this week that you're not allowed to put as the first picture um, that information. So I don't know. It's it's a little it's a little tricky. I use Facebook a lot. I can't say that. Um, I think Brian started using Command today to to see if he could get some leads off of that. But we just continue to offer incredibly professional photographs, um, professional videos, and then Matterport. I think this is a time where you cannot afford to take the pictures yourself. I never do anyway. I don't think Alan or Timothy ever do as well, or Mark. We always use a professional. So make sure that you don't skimp, I think is important. And um, get the word out. 
in the way that's comfortable to you, I always do it through Facebook. Very comfortable with that medium. Yeah. Not, nothing different. Say. Nothing different for me, Mark. I mean, it just always depends on the type of product. Uh, Matterport, I've always done. Uh, if it's a upper end home, I always do a drone video as well. Uh, that's something we've always done. Uh, not, nothing new on our side. Uh, the one thing I did do a little bit differently is I'm, I've been uh, filming videos at the house. And honestly, I just had my daughter go with me, given that I wasn't supposed to call anybody for a while. And I just walk through and I just talk as if I'm at an open house and touring people around and telling them the options. I did get a few calls from out of state. People are looking on it, which is say, hey, I'm in, live in Washington. Think about doing investment. Thank you for giving me the ideas. Uh, again, I you know, as with all marketing, you're just kind of blasting and just seeing what people will consume. Uh, I think given everything going on, just as many of these as possible is helpful. So Facebook also has a channel now, um, the stories, as does um, Instagram. Oh, yeah. Something that we did differently this time. And both Brian and Kenny did a joint video walkthrough of the house. And they posted that in their stories. They tagged me. I thought that was really clever. And uh, we're, you know... We're, Frankly, I am hoping with, with these restaurants opening up that eventually we will get some kind of a controlled environment with the open houses where we can have PEAD forms, we can line people up six feet apart out, out front, and I'm just hoping for that. I'm having dreams about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Yvette. Let's see here. Some people are uh, waiting to put occupied listings on the market. When will we start seeing those listings hit the market? From Mr. Brian, do we expect a surge of listings at any point? Um, I, I've been looking for it. I'm seeing it steadily, steadily grow, but it's not, nothing is really, it's not coming. We're not going to have 3,000 listings on the market. It's not going to double overnight. So I, I'm, it, it would be nice for our buyers, but I think people are releasing their listings slowly. And it'll build. If it builds, it'll build slowly. I mean, we need to get over. I mean, really, we should be at two, three thousand units. That'll be healthier than uh, where we're at now. I mean, the beginning of the year we had eight hundred tickets. So um, <clears throat> people are going to start putting them. I mean, as we just come out of shelter in place, so I think as people get more confidence about not getting COVID, um, we'll slowly but surely start seeing more come on. Uh, I've heard, you know, most, many people are thinking, you know, we, we've kind of been on pause for the past three, four months, and what's normally been our busy spring, it's just going to be delayed. It's going to be a really busy, busy summer beginning of fall before we end, um, before we end the year. Charles asked, if he has a seller with an older home, but he doesn't want to stage or make any updates, it looks like the 80s when you walk in. In a neighborhood where sales are between 950 and a little over 115, how do you address with the client the pros versus the cons? Does anyone want to take this or do you want me to take the first stab? Yvette, you seems like you, you, you have some experience since you're prepping your homes for sale. How, yeah. how would you handle this conversation? Well, I, I was about to say in all jest that if, he, if it looks like the 80s, he might want, you might want to suggest that he would, would get an 80s price as well. Um, yeah. but, that's in all jest. So the way I approach it again is I, sh I show facts. If you go to Facebook and you pull up your comps and with those comps, you want to actually show visuals. So do a Zoom call, pull up the comps so they can see it on the screen, then actually go through the pictures of the ones that are getting top dollar. That That's facts, right? They can't they're going to compare their house to this house and you explain to them if you update your house this is what you can get but if you don't update your house this is the other price that you get and you have to pull comps if you can that support that so that's how i got around this one because believe me this person in sunnyvale does not have the money to update the house so that's a little tricky uh but but they are doing it because they understand what's going to happen at the end if they want the top dollar if they want a few hundred thousand dollars more, it's better to put the, they're basically putting in about $58,000 into the house and that's going to garner, garner them about 250,000 plus more. So when you can show those kind, that kind of information, 
then build a team. I have a team or I know that every office, both of our offices here, we have a list of vendors that you can use. So I have a team of people who I use for flooring, for painting, for rehab of a kitchen, for uh, my landscaping. So build a team. And if you don't have a team, reach out to those of us who have references and we will gladly help you, um, you know, grow your team. Well, actually I have a very similar situation. I went to a listing, the house is about 950 to 1.15 as well. Um, and it's well a difficult decision for me to advise because I usually would suggest to, to fix up the house and make it look presentable. But then um, I have to look into their family situation because the husband and wife are about to get divorced. And, and you know, when it gets things go bad, it can, very, it can get really, really bad and you don't want to be in the middle of it. Uh, so, and here, even though at the moment, I mean, husband and wife still fighting on, on paying $10 on, on the thing here and there. When I was there, would they be able to consider like put in the money to remodel that home? So what I did, I, I make an analysis where the house were to be so at ease today, or if they put in the minimum to fix up the house, or they're going to go all out and make the house look presentable and to get the top dollar so that I have them choose to see what they want at the end of it. Besides, with, uh, I mean, as far now, I know that the market is doing phenomenal job. We also see there as uncertainty factor out there. And if it takes two months to fix up the house, right before the election, will the market allow us to make that top dollar? So I have to foresee the, the market to give them that advice because I don't want to list the house two months later and they're not getting the money that they invest into. Right. So by doing that, I actually get the husband and wife sit together, agree on what they want to do. And my number one thing is, if you guys choose to invest and do this home, remodel this home, you got to be in it together. I mean, even though they are in the process of filing the divorce, right? But I have to be very clear because I don't want them to put the money in and later on, they don't get that dollar back. I mean, I mean I'm not doing, I mean, so I, I did my part by, educate them very well about the, the, the dollar that they can get, the market condition, and what is going out there as far as the market today and the market in the next couple of months. So let me just jump in and say that I have a similar listing coming up and actually it's gonna be a trust sale and, uh, or well, yeah. The mother just had to be moved into uh, assisted living the house is basically just front to back full of junk. They, we're just gonna clear the house and sell it as is. They understand the price point they're gonna get as is and they're comfortable with that because of very similar to you, Timothy, the, our first duty is to care for the client, right? right? Make sure we understand their situation and if the situation is, um, is such that they can afford to remodel, great, but in, in a case like this, the decision was, it's not worth it. They understand the bottom line price. They need to sell it so that they can put money into caring for the mom that's in the assisted listing, living. All right, very good. Let's see. My screen share there because my battery's about to die. Okay. All right, so yeah, just one, one thing I wanted to touch about that. You know, when it comes to property condition, there's two things, right? There's the modern conveniences and the modern amenities and the, the nice, the granites, the, fa the, the fancy tiles, things of that nature. And the other factor to that is the cleanliness of the house. Now, when I'm evaluating a house of whether it's gonna to come to market, does it have to have all the fancy newest fixtures? No, but what it does have to be is clean. It has to be clean. If the house can't get to that point to where it's clean, then I'm really looking for off-market solutions. I'm gonna to go to my, my friends here in the office who have investors, I'm gonna to go to my investors, and then we're gonna to try to get it done off-market. Um, or we're gonna go on market at a very, very low price if it's dirty. Uh, it's a tough conversation to have uh, with a seller, especially they're there and they're the reason it is what it is. But you also have to keep in mind the market, and uh, the fact that we want to create a, a winnable scenario. 
And a lot of times people just don't realize what it means and what the upper end is. So if you explain to them that, hey, you know, if you give me five grand in three weeks, I'll give you 15. How does that sound? That sounds good. Sounds good. How many times did you make that investment? 100%, right? Okay, well, I'm going to need five grand to fix your floor and paint your walls. And with that five grand, you're going to get 15 grand in return when we go sell your house. It's undisputable, undeniable. 100% of the time. So then it comes up to your client. Is he a business person or is he not, are they not a business person? If they don't understand that concept, then it's going to be a tough, a tough road. Again, you may want to call those investors. Um, but if they do understand that concept, then, then it becomes a lot more clear. Now, when you are deciding or choosing to make those improvements, my personal opinion is just stick to paint and floors. Paint and floors will make the house look clean. And you'll get it done in about a week, maybe week and a half. And that will get you a fair result on the market. A clean house, not new, but fresh paint, nice floor. People feel good when they're in a clean house. So that can be done with a very minimal investment. Once you get into kitchen remodeling, bathroom remodeling, that goes two months. Then the market could change. Then you're taking that risk. So just keep that in mind. Here. All right, so yeah, Charles had a trust sale, okay. Any data where people are relocating to? Does anyone have any data on that? Where, where to go to see where people are moving? I don't know exactly where off the top of my head. I've seen some heat charts on some, some places, but not, not enough to share right now. What, any, Alan, Yvette, or anyone else? No. Or I just no. saw an article. Go ahead, Alan. No, I haven't seen anything other than articles that are talking about moving to East Bay, but go ahead. I just saw an article, but um, are, are we talking about moving out of state? Yeah, where people are relocating if they're leaving the area. I saw an article that showed that Texas was the number one place that people were moving to up till January of this year, and now it has become Florida. Tax friendly states. I didn't hear you. What? I said tax friendly states are typical. Yeah. You know, when people are, are relocating, especially the empty nesters. Yeah. Nevada, Arizona, Florida. Texas is very affordable, although they're not tax free, but still they've been a big, a big source over, over time. Well, guys, it's been an hour. Thank you guys for joining us today. If you have any further questions, uh, or if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Uh, I'll try my best to address it offline, and always feel free to reach out offline, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you guys have uh, regarding the market. Uh, until then, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you guys tomorrow 